Oh, I hate this laptop. Remember when you said so excited? Mousepad. The mouse pad specifically is driving me crazy on the laptop. Other than that, it's a wonderful laptop. All things, all things being equal, it's mostly, it's mostly the, that mouse pad is uh, with a little, a little pointery do. Gotcha. Yeah. It do be like that. On this day, the sixth of June, of our Lord Bahamut. Is savior, that is that our Lord? Savior. Or we I thought it, I thought it was the moon, or was the moon our secretary? The moon is our yes, our secretary. Our secretary. Our and secretary. they're very bad at their job. That is that is that is for damn sure. I haven't gotten mail in months. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh the bean, on the other hand, the cat. Very, very big fan of I think she's a very big fan of the new setup for the room. It's not on camera, but the desk has been turned. It has been. A full 180 degrees. Is it 180? Mm hmm Yeah, it is 180, yeah. She's a big fan. She's a big fan. She now has uh, more more easily accessible perches to view the outside world with. Yes. She's expanded her world view quite a bit. But yeah, how, how, are, how are you, Sam? How's this week been going for you? I mean, today I took care of, of uh, car stuff, and now I don't have to worry about car stuff anymore, so I'm much better. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> I don't have any car stuff, so I've just been, I've just been living it up, honestly. Just honestly. stress free. To hundred percent, hundred percent stress free. I'm, I'm stress level. Oh, she knew, she knew. She jumped up on the cat. Jumped up onto the desk. She knows she's not allowed to do that, and then immediately jump back down. Stress level sitting right at, directly at zero. Directly at zero. Stress level almost below, but stress level right at zero. Almost below. You're almost into euphoria. Almost. Almost. Uh, but yes, welcome. This is the Dungeon Bros podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. We are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And uh, we don't really have any Dungeons or Dragony news to talk about. But what we do want to talk about is our sponsor for this week, uh, the wonderful, the wonderfully made game uh, for modern consoles mm -hmm. from Daedalic Entertainment Studios, uh, Lord of Ring Gollum. Now I want to make sure everybody heard not not the hit not the game that came out the Lord of the Rings no 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 Gollum. no I'm no you we're saying the same thing Lord of Ring Gollum TM well well wait hold on I need you to I need you to repeat that one more time Lord of Ring colon Gollum trademark now now if I were to scroll down on our our little page a little bit I, what is the uh, what is the upcoming uh, Magic the Gathering set that we're going to be talking oh, about oh that's the the Lord of the Rings the Tales of Middle Earth okay yeah. Okay. We're sponsored by Lord of Ring Gollum. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. For those of you that don't know, the hit game, The Lord of the Rings Gollum from Data Like Entertainment, is fucking terrible. <laughs> God awful experience. Like one of the worst reviewed games for a very, very long time. And in the, the patented apology.jpg that all of these companies have whenever they release a game that's not ready, which is like most games that come out these days sad um they literally in the first line they they make the name of the game lord of ring colon Gollum. trade tm yeah so, bolded in everything no not the lord of the rings lord of ring Gollum. even though not an inch above on the image is the logo the lord of the rings Gollum. If you're interested in a game that looks like it was designed in 2009 and plays like it, plays like it was designed in 2004. Yeah, then uh, then check out Lord of the Rings Gollum. It's probably on sale everywhere. Because we're not going to play it. It is widely regarded as bad. <laughs> oh, he, he. I will say, I don't know if you've seen it. Have you seen any screenshots from the game specifically of Gollum? Yeah. Oh my God. He looks like he looks like a fucking crack addled Tommy Pickles. That is the Rugrats. best description of yes, yes. It's, it's it's bad, man. It is bad. Um, yeah. So that thank you, Daedalic Entertainment, for sponsoring the Dungeon Bros podcast, Lord of Ring Gollum TM. Also, they didn't actually sponsor us. That yep. I thought that I I I like to imagine that our audience is hip enough to realize. You know what? what I'm, I'm just here for separate the... the sponsor from the joke sponsor. So I'm far, just... no sponsors. No sponsors. <laughs> no sponsors. I'm just here to make sure that those new listeners, those shiny-faced uh, uh, people who are about to love us, those young bucks, don't don't get put off uh, by you. 
I, I'm put I put off like everyone. It's exactly. Fine. I don't care. Uh, we have a merch store, we Dungeon, Bro, Dungeon Bros merch store. You can check out the links in all of the bios, which, by the way, there is a new link in bio. We're using a new link in bio service. Things look differently. Apparently, the Discord link uh, doesn't work, even though it totally worked for me when I did it on my PC. So, you know, your mileage may vary if you use the TikTok app, I guess, because so. TikTok is a wonderfully designed application with no flaws whatsoever, he said on TikTok Live. Service that totally hasn't uh, scorned us. Not at all. Not at all. But you can get stickers. We got shirts. We got a little zip-up hoodie that Sam is a fan of. I I ordered a tank top. I'm still waiting on that to arrive. I'm very excited. It'll be a wonderful thing. But yes, we have a merch store. Uh, People have still been checking out our homebrew, even though we haven't released anything in 2023 because of all the OGL nonsense. People have still been uh, downloading the various... We have a bunch of free homebrew packs for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, Mm -hmm. uh, which will be backwards compatible, of course, with... 1 D&D. Uh, you can check out the Blood Magic and Hemocraft supplement. Highly recommend. Big fan. Also, controversy. Yes. There's controversy surrounding this one Lord of the Rings set. I don't want to get into it really because it's really just kind of boring and trite. And and, and we heard very similar things with the yeah. Rings of Power when that was first oh, coming yeah. out. It's just it, People change their tune on the Rings of Power to complain about other things, but... Yeah. Rings of Power is great. I enjoyed it and did vastly. I I, yeah. I uh, understand some of the concerns, but I don't think that they ruined the show by any means. Not at all. Uh, f- uh, fuck the haters. Rings of Power was good. But, of course, everyone is upset that Aragorn is black. You know who else is black? Thaden is black. Thaden looks awesome. He looks like uh, Kari Payton from The Walking Dead. Never oh. watched that. Yeah, he was also on, he's, he played on Critical Role. He was Shakasta. Oh right. Yes, he play he plays a character on The Walking Dead that has like his white hair and like dreads and stuff, and it looks exactly like the Theoden card. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, people are upset that Aragorn is black. Um, two points, two points. I'll say. First point, in the books, it is written that Aragorn is like gruff and dirty, and probably like a tan white person. Second point, eh, it doesn't fucking matter. No. It never mattered. His the the color of his skin was like the least important part of the description because uh, the most important part was that he looked somewhat regal. And oh, sorry for sorry for bumping the TikTok mic there. But the most important description was that he looked regal and that he was dirty for bringing it from being outside and stuff. Yeah, from being a ranger in the wilds for months. So you know find something else to get upset about like the fact that the balrog card doesn't have wings and it should Ooh, you're more upset about you're very upset about this Ooh, the balrog should have wings people are upset that the depiction in in the lord of the rings films with peter jackson depicted the balrog with wings the balrog looks cooler with wings i mean Let's, let's just be honest here the whole thing is that the balrogs are like angelic beings anyway just created by morgoth instead of the other deities like you know anwe and shit Manway. See, I've heard more uh, upsetness about the 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 mechanics on the Balrog. I mean, it's not a good card. It's not a good card. It's a. I believe it's red, black, and three, uh, for a seven five seven seven. A five mana seven seven with trample, which is totally fine. And when a legendary creature an opponent controls dies, put the Balrog Flame of Udun on the bottom of its owner's library. So, a five mana seven seven with trample that doesn't stay on the battlefield very long. No, like it's. <laughs> I, I'm unless sure you're just getting that thing out to sack it, I don't know what you're. I'm want. sure there. I'm sure there's plenty of cases and interesting things you can design it around. I suspect that it will not be uh, one of the big cards of the set, particularly a commander card. But you know, Balrog should have wings. If you disagree, then you're wrong, and that's okay. <laughs> Moving on, uh, we have up. We, we'll just quickly go over the upcoming releases as we know them. Of course. Uh, for D and D, we have Bigby Presents Glory of Giants that's going to drop on August fifteenth, as well as the Practical Complete Guide to Dragons, also on August fifteenth. Chances are these are going to be the last books that are not like sixty or seventy dollars. Yes, they Which... have announced a price increase. Um, due to whatever reasons they have decided on the yeah. day. Yeah, we talked about it last week on the pod, or last episode of the podcast, not last week. We record every two weeks and post every two weeks. We, we like to be respectful of your time somewhat, and then we ramble on about nonsense. But the, their, their reasoning for the price increases, it, it makes sense from the point of view of a company, particularly, like, the book prices have not increased, and inflation has gone fucking wild since 2014. It mm-hmm. just has. Yeah. 
Um, but at the same time, they're not they're not showing a value proposition to warrant a price increase. Now, if part of their announcement of a D&D book price increase was was highlighting like, hey, well, we're going to start doing this with the one D&D books, and this is why, because one D&D books are going to have a code that you can redeem on D&D Beyond, and you get a digital version, which you can also get access to virtual tape. Like, if they went through and explained all that, then I bet people would be more okay with it. People are not going to be okay with it because it's Wizards of the Coast. Right. But... People would be more okay with it if they just approached it better instead of just trying to, like, shit it out in a blog post and brush it away. Yeah, which they've done a lot. They've been doing that a lot. But we also know of the Fandelver and Below, the Shattered Obelisk, a uh, little adventure is going to be on September 19th, Planescape Adventures in the Multiverse, October 16th, and The Book of Many Things on November 14th. They have jam-packed a lot of stuff into this year. Yeah, especially, I mean, we all, we of course, know that they wanted to get... They want to keep their their releases. Mm-hmm. They want to make sure they get all their releases because their investors are going to be mad if they don't do the releases. Uh, but at the same time, they want to make sure they get them all in before, you know, one D and D or whatever they're going to be calling it when yeah. the project officially comes to print. Uh, they want to get that out. Um, we get everything out before that is print, is dropped. Oh, for sure, for sure. And we still don't have a set release date or window other than 2024 20, for the mm-hmm. one D&D products. Uh, so we're just kind of waiting. We're just kind of waiting. We also have upcoming Magic the Gathering sets. Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle Earth. By the time you listen to this, uh, that would be tomorrow on June 7th. Uh, actually, no, not this episode. The next episode of the podcast. Okay, the next episode drops. Is when the official release for the Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle Earth, but between this episode and next episode is when pre-release is going to happen. We're going to have some live. Sh- we're going to have a live stream on the sixteenth of us cracking some of our pre-release kits on TikTok, uh, and I'm, go- I'm doing a bit of a video series, a short series. I would like to put them on all of the platforms, but we'll see how that works out. Of uh, trying to collect all of the cards in the Lord of the Rings set. That's a lot. Yep. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about alt arts yet. I might just do the base set to begin with and then see where I am with the alt arts and see if that's something I want to pursue. But uh, we're going to try to collect all of them. That includes the one of one serialized one ring. He said jokingly. I'm, I'm, I plan on buying at some point some collector boosters. Just you got You can't win unless you play. True. Gambler's fallacy. But at the same time, uh, I don't think you have the power of, say, Cassius Marsh, uh, who is all right. Offering- $500,000. No, no, no. Half a million dollars for the one ring. He's offered a bounty. Yeah, I'm not I'm not buying the one of one one ring. No. I'm cracking it from a pack like God intended. But then are you going to sell it for a half a million dollars? Um, TBD. TBD. First thing I would do is uh, I would I would contact Wizards of the Coast to get it verified uh, with the pack. Because the pack have like serial codes in them and they can verify that yeah. it's the actual real one. Once that's verified, probably would send it off to get it graded. Maybe fly out to bring it physically to them so I don't have to ship it mm-hmm. to get it graded. Uh, and then once it's graded, contact as much as you might not like people like this. Uh, Mr. Beast, Logan Paul. like <laughs> Any big name who... Uh... They're going to give... Like Logan Paul is going to give a shit. Like, most people, like, contact the professor, all that kind of sh- shit, do the fucking circuit, get all the sub numbers up for all the Dungeon Bros stuff, <laughs> uh, and then f- decide whether or not I sell it from there after I do a press junket, obviously. <laughs> I feel like that that's the clear... If you if you are any kind of content creator and you happen to pull the one of one, one ring, yeah. then that's you the- better hold on to it and get your fucking money's worth before selling it that's the formula yes uh also on november 3rd they're going to be releasing uh, a special edition of lord of the rings the tales of middle earth like a little expansion set and i'm just going to jump down to the wrap-up because we do have a little bit of uh some spoilers some deets a little bit a little bit of an early listing on the amazon.com we specifically see uh collector boosters special edition uh which is going to be this set that comes out on November 3rd. Also around that same time frame, we've seen we're seeing specific universes beyond box sets that include a frame and six borderless cards to depict two scenes, specifically Gandalf in the Pelennor fields and it shows the uh, uh, Gandalf the White fighting off the big drake uh, creature that 
uh, the Witch King of Angmar flies, and uh, the Might of Galadriel, which shows Galadriel doing some powerful magic and exploding a, on, on a bunch of orcs. But it looks like it's going to be six scene cards, three set boosters, and then six art cards and display easel. Uh, no price listed for that one, and I don't believe that one is listed on Amazon anymore. Last I checked, I have an Amazon link here to the Collector Booster Special Editions, the single packs, the box pack set. Uh, doesn't seem to be listed anymore, but uh, if it still exists as of the posting of this podcast on uh, Wednesday the 7th, it will be in the link in the bio, and until that link is broken, it'll exist. It'll also be an affiliate link in there the you YouTube go. description, so if you pre-order it then that would help us out they're which like 33 cool. bucks a pack yeah 33 bucks for a collector booster which you know it's kind, kind of, of surprisingly like shockingly affordable at the at this point yeah i think it's compared just, to everything else we've seen i think it's mostly just flying under the radar at this point possibly yeah, yeah. somebody posted and yeah uh, I believe in the last episode of the podcast, we talked about the Commander Master set a little mm-hmm. bit, going over the commanders for the commander decks that are available. That set is going to be coming out on August 4th. Probably going to be a lot of good reprints in there. Uh, very, very expensive. Oh, yeah. Very expensive set. Uh, Wilds of Eldraine, we got pre-release on September 1st with the, f- September 1st with the official launch on September 8th. Uh, the Doctor Who, Universes Beyond Commander decks, October 13th. And then the Lost Caverns of Ixalan in some time in November of 2023. With all that being said, a little bit of a look ahead. We're going to talk about the Pathfinder remastered. They're removing the drow from the uh, the remastering of Pathfinder 2nd Edition. We'll talk about that later. And we'll talk about Candela Obscura mm-hmm. a little bit in the, in the new Critical Role RPG systems. But we got to talk about what we got to talk about today. And that is... The Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth. It is spoiler season. We are in the thick of it, and they have been handing out so many preview cards. There are currently, according to MTG Goldfish, as of the time of recording this, there are 208 cards spoiled. Uh, We do not know the total number of cards. We do not know the total number of mythics, rares, commons, uncommons. But we have seen 19 mythics, 44 rares, 78 uncommons, and 46 commons. We are not going to go through all of them. That would be foolish of us. No. But... I think we're just going to go back and forth. We're going to pick some cards. We're going to talk about anything that we deem important to discuss. And I'm going to start it off with uh, my most anticipated card of the set, the mythic Aragorn the Uniter. Oh, yeah. Aragorn the Uniter is red, green, white, blue. Uh, He is a 5-5 black human noble. Um, (laughs) Get it? Yeah. Get it? Yeah. 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 Because he's because the art depicts him as black and people are going to get uh, triggered by that. For some reason, anywho, uh, all of the all of the abilities that he has are static abilities. Whenever you cast a white spell, create a one one white human soldier creature token. Whenever you cast a blue spell, scry two. Whenever you cast a red spell, Aragorn the Unifier deals three damage to target opponent. And whenever you cast a green spell, target creature gets plus four plus four until end of turn. This is a multicolor cards matter deck, mm-hmm. and I believe uh, one of five four color cards that has like ever been printed oh really something like that it's like it's a Him, very Atraxa. low it's like a traxa <laughs> omnath oh, yeah the omnath locus uh, the one before the phyrexian before the before completed. the martian machine yeah um it's it's very few like definitely less than 10 i believe i saw it was less than five like this might be the fifth four color legendary creature gotcha. ever which is pretty cool. Uh, all of those static abilities are 100%. Hey, get as many cards that have two or three colors that are instants and sorceries and cast away, mm-hmm. if you will. Um, I'm very excited that I plan on I plan on building this if I if I manage to get him 100%. I mean, you're you're going for everything, so you know. Yeah, everything but black in in the Aragorn, which there are a lot of really good black mana cards, black mana, black, black color pip. identity. Have black cards pips in, in the, the set in the casting cost. In the set, Sam. What do you want to talk about? Oh God, I. Um, oh, you know what I want to talk about is uh, the uh, spider. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, here we go. Shelob, child of Ungoliant. Ungoliant, uh, legendary creature, spider demon, eight eight, uh, for four black green, has death touch and ward two. Other spiders you control have death touch and ward two. It's when fucked. <laughs> That is so fucked. Right there. That's that's a, that's <laughs> that's spi- a gr- that spider tribe right great, there. Great card. Um, but then it has a third thing. Whenever another creature deals damage, 
uh, whenever another creature dealt damage by a spider you control dies. Sorry, let me start off. When another creature dealt damage this turn by a spider you control dies, create a token that is a copy of that creature, except it's a food token artifact with pay two, tap, sacrifice this artifact, you gain three life, and it loses all other card types. Um, yep. So, you first co- off, you just, you just copy everything that you die, that you kill. Yeah. I mean, uh, Golgari Spider Tribal, first off, cool. Uh, not too... I was looking at it yesterday. There's not a huge amount of spiders that aren't more than just base, base you know, tough, uh, base power and toughness of like 1-3 mm-hmm. and then have reach. Yeah. Some have death touch, but... Tons, uh, of, tons of spiders have reach. They're oh, yeah. all pretty much going to have reach, death touch, ward 2. Yeah. With she love out. And... Uh, not to mention changelings. Oh, Yeah. There, there's a lot of changeling shenanigans, and then just getting artifact copies of, of everyone's of, of powerful creatures. creatures. <laughs> yeah, you find you find that. Th- I mean, since a lot of decks do revolve around like, oh, like uh, landfall abilities. Sure, you lose, you can't attack or block with that creature, but all of a sudden you have a food token that says whenever a land enters the battlefield, do something cool. Mm-hmm. Or if you're oh, about, yeah. and then if you're about to die, pay two. All right, I have three more life. Yeah, it's it's rough. The the tokens. The the food token is a very big component of the Lord of the Rings. It is, yeah. And most of them look like delicious hobbity foods. And then some of them look like a body that's wrapped up in web. And it's fucking terrifying. (laughs) (laughs) But it's awesome. Yeah, the Shelob, it makes me want to get over my fear of spiders because it is that powerful. But uh, next one I want to talk about, a first of its kind, a legendary instant. Mmm. Two black black, it is Isildur's Fateful Strike. Legendary instance uh, can only be cast if you control a legendary creature or planeswalker. Uh, For four mana, you destroy target creature. If its controller has four or more cards in hand, they exile cards from their hand equal to the difference. So they're basically going down, they're exiling cards from their hand down to four cards, and then you destroy a creature. For four mana, not super efficient, and the legendary restriction is a bit a bit weird uh the flavor there of course is that you're chopping off a finger yeah so you only have four fingers left haha <laughs> because you know a sealed or strike removing the ring from the hand of sauron uh the legendary instants and sorceries are not super common they're not super no common. no they are uh, them and tribal uh sorceries yeah. and stuff kind of i think for the most part fell by the wayside with their well with the legendary stuff it has the restriction of you have to have a legendary creature to cast it yeah as opposed to the like the tribal things, which didn't really have any requirements, were just kind of a weird. They were just named. They just had an, an additional subtype for some reason. Um, I'm sure the people out there that are smarter than us know what that reason is and can uh, dictate to, that to us at some point. Uh, but yeah, first of its kind, legendary instant, is Sailor's Faithful Strike. Probably not going to be played very much. Yeah, well, but it do be like that. it do be like that. Same. Uh, this is a card we've known about for a while. It was one of the first cards announced for the set, and that's Tom Bombadil. Mm, mm, Five color mm. commander, legendary creature, god bard, 4-4. Four, four. As long as there are four or more lore counters among sagas you control, Tom Bombadil has hexproof and indestructible. Whenever the final chapter ability of a saga you control resolves, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a saga card. Put that card onto the battlefield and the rest onto the bottom of your library in a random order. This ability triggers only once each turn. Okay. Tom Bombadil. Tom Bombadil. The only five color card of the set. People were, were very concerned that he might not be included because he was uh, not included in the movies, which Correct. is a little silly. He's also kind of a side character that's not super important in the books, if we're being completely honest with ourselves. Everybody loves Tom Bombadil. I like Tom Bombadil. He's not super important. I Here, said it. It's more representative and, and a deeper, it's supposed to be a deeper yeah. thought process, but... Uh, yeah. The card, though, Sagas Tribal. Sagas Tribal, yeah. And there's, I mean, there's, first off, so many good sagas out there in general. But then secondly, there are so many good sagas just in this set. Oh, they printed a lot of really good sagas at, like, three or four mana. Not to mention the Phyrexian sagas. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, yeah. It's... Tom Bombadil is going to be like this weird mix of like Praetor and Saga's tribal Mm -hmm. 100. Like that's going to be the most popular version of Tom Bombadil. He is also, I mean, I mean the stat, the static ability of Hexproof. It's, it's whatever. Yeah. That's pretty much whatever. That's whatever. But just getting the lore counters and it's, 
and and so many activated abilities oh, each so or so many i guess triggered, triggered abilities yeah they're triggered when you move yeah. the counter up yeah. yeah uh yeah tom bombadil is top tier i have two enchantments here they're not really associated with each other but i'm gonna go through them quickly because one of them is very easy and uh they're right next to each other on the page that we're looking at Fair we're enough. using mtg goldfish to look at the spoilers for uh tales of middle earth but the two are uh the first one flowering of the white tree it's a legendary enchantment for two white mana legendary creatures you control have plus two plus one and have ward one non-legendary creatures you control get plus one plus one very simple uh the reason i bring this up is because this will absolutely be going in jota there's a lot of legendary matters there cards. are a lot of legendary matters cards and a lot of them are going to be going in my jota the unifier deck it's going to be jota uh lord of the ring if you will, <laughs> is what will happen. But the other enchantment is forged an, Forge Anew, a uh, two-white enchantment that when Forge Anew enters the battlefield, return target equipment card from your graveyard to the battlefield. As long as it's your turn, you may activate equip abilities anytime you could cast an instant, and you may pay zero rather than pay the equip cost of the first equip ability you activate during each of your turns. Instant speed equip. Yeah. As someone who has made an equipment deck and who has been wanting to make a good equipment deck for a while, I have lamented the fact that you can't equip things at instant speed and how awesome that would be. Forge anew for three mana. You can do that. You get one of your equipments that may have been removed back onto the battlefield, and then you can presumably immediately equip it if you use the pay zero feature at the bottom. So mm -hmm. you get one free equip on each of your turns. You can activate equip abilities, shifting around all of your stuff in response to other people doing things if you leave mana open. This is a great equipment card. Oh, yeah. This, that's like that's going to be a staple of equipment decks that have access to white. 100%. For sure. And since a lot of equipment decks are Boros. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. What do you got, Sam? Uh, uh, yeah. This is... Oh, I just had it and I lost it. Do, 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 do. Ah, here we go. Uh, this is actually a common card, and uh, mm. it's been pointed out, is the Mirkwood Bats. It's three and a black for a bat cre for a creature, bat, two, three, flying. And it has a ability, whenever a creature, whenever you create or sacrifice a token, each opponent loses one life. Um, now, this is in black. Uh, so that, that, my mind immediately goes to two things. Rakdos, which mm -hmm. likes to create uh, artifact tokens, especially treasures and yeah. blood tokens, uh, as well as um, the black green elf tribal deck. Oh, yeah, Golgari. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, Golgari. Like a uh, Lathril, Blade of the Elves. Yep. And she has ability to just create a whole ton of elves. Lots of tokens. And so whenever one of those gets created, oh, well, there goes one an opponent. Each opponent loses one life. Yeah. Or, oh. I have a Nationals altar. Just sacrifice them all and drain the table. Mm -hmm. And that's a common. Yes. So uh, in my PDH deck that I'm creating for Jury Master of the Review. That'd be very good. Which is all about creating tokens and stacking them. That'd be great. Oh. That'll be very, very good. Yeah, those kinds of abilities on common cards usually have uh, the text. Can only activate once per turn. Yeah. First time each turn. Something like that. Yeah. To limit it. So it's really cool that it's unlimited like that. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to discuss one of the few flavor fails of the set. Mm, okay. One of the few flavor fails. Now, everybody here is familiar with the Fellowship of the Ring. Indeed. This not not the film or the book, but specifically the Fellowship being you know Gandalf, Aragorn, Frodo, Sam, Pippin, Merry, Gimli, like, the whole group, the yes. gaggle of them. I think it would have been cool if they had like a friendship type ability where it's like you can pair any any to um any two of the cards that have say for example if there were an ability called fellowship you could pair any two fellowship cards together as partnered commanders kind of like instance. the um, the friends forever ability yes. from uh the stranger things set yes yes something like that or at the very least specifically the cards i want to talk about gimli counter of kills and legolas counter of kills that would be a, yeah they could have been partner with 
each other. <laughs> I think that's a bit of a flavor fail. Uh, Gimli is a four mana, three red, four three dwarf warrior with trample. Whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, Gimli counter of kills deals one damage to that creature's controller. And then Legolas counter of kills is a four mana, two green, blue, two three elf archer with reach. Whenever you scry, if Legolas counter of kills is tapped, you may untap it. Do this only once per turn. Whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, put a plus one plus one counter on Legolas. Getting access to green, blue, red would have unlocked a lot of fun things you could do with this uh, killing things matters <laughs> plus counter of kills. I mean, of course, you're familiar with the films when they make every battle a competition with who yes. can kill more orcs. A little, orcs. One, of the, one of the rare flavor fails in my mind in this set. There's a lot. This, this set is chock full of massive flavor wins. Uh, but Sam, what other what other card you get? I, if we want to stay on flavor, um, this one is while well, a flavor win, kind of a mechanical sadness. Uh, that is, uh, well, as we mentioned again, the uh, the Balrog. Mm-hmm. Um, just that that there's again, like you said earlier, there's probably some use for whenever your legendary creature your opponent controls dies, put it on the bottom of your deck. I'm not sure what that is, and I I'm excited for. When we inevitably see somebody put together that deck and play it on uh, on you know one of the the many shows that are out yeah. there, oh yeah, it, the, someone's gonna someone's gonna break that deck for sure. I don't I don't see I don't see the power rug getting a ton of use really at all. You know, there are some cards that just don't get a lot of use unless you're at a high level play and you can see the and you can see the matrix. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you see the matrix. I don't 90% of the time, I don't even know I'm I don't even know all of the cards in my deck when I'm playing it and I build each one. Oh yeah, same. Same. I half the time it's like search for for search your deck for uh like like last night during our one of our weekly Magic the Gathering Monday night magic live streams on TikTok where we played two-player commander i was playing joe to the unifier and there's a lot of cards that allow me to search for lands in my deck some of them it's like search for one of them was search for a mountain plains island or forest card and i'm like all right what do i have what do i have what do i have oh man i have all of these dual lands that don't have like the subtype planes so like all that kind of stuff eventually i found one mm-hmm. i was like i don't even remember which ones are left in my deck right at all it's bad um for me next I made I made a bit of a TikTok, a bit of a funny. Yeah. Made 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 a made an Instagram and a tweet as well, where the laughs. There were many a laugh. Shadow facts. Lord of Horses, three red white for a four four horse, a legendary creature horse. Horses you control have haste. There's reminder text for haste. Of course. They can attack and tap as soon as they come under your control. They do not have summoning sickness. Also, whenever Shadow Facts Lord of Horses attacks. You may put a creature card with lesser power from your hand onto the battlefield, tapped and attacking. Very good card in Boros. Mm-hmm. Very aggressive. Love it. It has reminder text for haste, though. Sam, I don't know if you're aware. There's a lot of there's a lot of creature cards at common and uncommon that only have the word haste in their text box, and even they don't get reminder text. Even they don't get reminder text. It's almost as like. It's like someone got on Shadow Facts, of course, being the Lord of Horses is a horse. Yes. It's almost like some wizened white wizard like Gandalf got onto his back and said, come Shadowfax, show us the meaning of haste. That is a quote from Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. No, it's at the beginning of Return of the King. What am I talking about? It's at the beginning of Returning of the King when he's taking Pippin and they're leaving Rohan and going to Gondor. He says, Shadowfax, show us the meaning of haste. And here is the Shadowfax card, literally showing us the meaning of haste. Thank you. Flavor win, Samuel. <laughs> less of a uh, less of a direct card, but more of a the going back to the food mechanic. As we've seen, obviously there is a uh, the Hobbit's deck, mm-hmm. the the Sam and Frodo deck, uh, pre constructed deck is coming out. Has a lot to deal with food, but they also have a lot of cards not in those in that deck that are dealing with food in this set. And uh, that's actually something I've I've you know. As somebody who enjoys cooking myself in real life, and also uh, who has like you know seen a, a handful of cards that are like, oh, this is really cool, but it requires a food token to do. Mm. Oh no, there's not that many food tokens already in the game unless you're running Academy Manufacturer and making a bunch of treasures. Yeah. Um. So I'm actually excited for all the different food things 
and uh, having have, making my lunch deck. Your lunch deck. I'm going to call it this. Lunch a bunch deck. I don't know. I like to name my decks. Um, and uh, I just name them the the important card. Well, like, them. <laughs> shield up is going to be spiders, man. I would like to talk about stern scolding next. <laughs> <laughs> stern scold it. This uh, depicting Gandalf calling Pippin fool of a took, obviously. Indeed. Um, the reason I want to bring this up, this is a one blue mana instant card. Counter target creature spell with power or toughness to or less. What are some really pervasive cards, creature cards, that are one or two power or toughness or less? We got Ragavan. Ragavan. We got uh, Dockside Extortionist. Esper Sentinel. Um... Plenty more. Birds, birds of Paradise. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. There's so, Most of you, yeah. there's so many disruptive one and two drop cards in all of the formats that have power or toughness of two or less. And this is a one mana counter target creature spell that can hit all of them. And that's power to power or toughness two or less. It's not yes. even power and toughness two or less. It's not. It could be a two five. It could be a six two. Yeah. Like, it, it hits most. It hits a lot. We're looking at the wall now of our various cards. I was just I curious to see any if any of, of these like. No, but yeah, a lot of like tree, a lot of like defender things that may be very oh, yeah. powerful, or I expect some tree folk are out there. They're like one seventeen. Oh yeah, it, it can hit all of them. And the, there's also there's several wonderful tree folk cards in this set as well. Yeah, I believe one of them is a is a three ten. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. But yeah, I want to. I just wanted to shout that out because it's a very. It's a. It seems like a very specifically designed. This will counter a lot of problematic things. Mm-hmm. Card for one mana, a one mana counter spell for most of the problematic creatures in a lot of formats. I see it getting a lot of play, especially since it's printed at uncommon, so it's probably not going to be very expensive. Yeah, we hope. Certainly would hope. Do you have anything else, or can I rattle off a couple of things? Uh, the last one I want to talk about in uh, it's a uh, it's Orcish Bowmasters. It's a one one with for one and a black with flash, and whenever Orcish Bowmasters enters the battlefield, and whenever or- an opponent draws a card, except for the first one they draw on each of their draw steps, Orcish Bowmaster deals one damage to any target. Mm-hmm. Then amass orcs one. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Now by uh, by itself. Not a, you know, not an extreme card by any means. Uh, it is rare. Um, it's a little rude, but... A little rude. But that sort of thing, can I can easily see becoming, like, just uh, a win con, in, or at least a, a mini board wipe if you give it, like, um, death touch. Oh, yeah. And then start just, hey, everybody draw a card. Hey, everybody draw a card, too. Howling Minds, uh, kind of a group hug uh, yeah. board wipe almost. Oh, yeah. Um, I want to. I want to quickly. Yeah, that. I'm a big fan. Big fan. It's going to. It's going to be a very popular card in a lot of formats. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, got to shout out the legendary lands. Uh, the Shire, Minds of Moria, Minas Tirith. They enter in untapped. If you control a legendary creature, they tap for a single color each, and then they have some pretty juicy uh, activated abilities that you can use if you have a lot of mana and nothing to cast. But I want to shout out the sagas. Like, there's a ton. One ring to rule them all. The second one destroys all non-legendary creatures. Uh, there and back again. A five-mana red saga where the third one creates smog. A 6-6 red dragon creature token with flying in haste. And when this creature dies, create 14 treasure tokens. Um, if you copy this legendary card or this legendary token, mm-hmm. legend rule... One of them gets destroyed. You immediately get 14 treasures. Mm -hmm. That, just putting that out there. War of the Last Alliance. Twice you can search for a legendary creature card, legendary creature tutor, twice. And then all of your creatures get double strike and the ring tempts you. Uh, the book of the book of Marzabul not as powerful. You get some amass orcs. You get some, it's, if you're running amass orcs and you got red, that's pretty cool. Uh, Long list of the Ents, a single green mana for a six-stage saga, and all of them are, note a creature type that has not been noted for long list of the Ents. When you cast your next creature spell of that type this turn, that creature entered... Basically, pick a creature type you haven't picked yet. It's like anti-tribal. Yeah. <laughs> anti-tribal, and it's one green mana. Go in your Volo deck. A six, a six saga, a six-stage saga, I believe. Oh, yes. Tale of Tunuviel. 
Uh, target creature gets indestructible as long as you control the enchantment. Uh, return a creature card from the graveyard to the battlefield. Up to two target creatures each get lifelink. Uh, the bath song. Draw two cards, then discard a card twice. Uh, shuffle any number of target cards from your graveyard into your library, and you add two blue mana. So if you're if you're running if you're running like a little spell slingery kind of dig through your deck blue deck, mm-hmm. highly useful. Uh, I also want to shout out the nine different arts for the Nazgul. Uh, Nazgul, two black, a one-two Wraith Knight with Death Touch. When Nazgul enters the battlefield, the ring tempts you. Whenever the ring tempts you, you put a plus one, plus one counter on each Wraith you control. A deck can have up to nine cards named Nazgul. So your commander deck can have nine Nazgul cards, and you can run a pseudo Wraith Tribal with that you want to tempt yourself with the ring a lot. Yeah. And you just get... If you have multiple Nazgul, not only... They the ring tempts you is the first text. When the ring tempts you, it then triggers the next text on the Nazgul card. So you immediately enter this card will immediately enter as a two three with the plus one plus one counter and death touch. And if you have multiple of these out, every time you tempt, they're all going you're gonna get a fuck ton of plus one plus one counters. Not something you normally get access to in black. Right. It's usually a white or a green sort of thing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, shout out to Black Theoden. He looks like Kari Payton. We talked about that already. Uh, lots of cool equipments. Ooh, this is going to be a... I, I predict this is going to be a staple popper land here. Great Hall of the Citadel. A common land that taps for colorless, or you can pay one and tap it to add two mana in any combination of colors. You can spend that mana only to cast legendary spells. Hmm. Not a ton of legendaries in popper, but for popper EDH, there's plenty of legendary uncommons. And it's in many ways better than a lot of the filter lands where it's like pay one and tap it and then you get a different color. Yeah. Whereas this you pay one and tap it and then you get two colors in any combination. <coughs> Shut up. Sorry. But yeah. How I'll dare help. you? How dare you this spring act like that? How dare you? Uh, that is really all we got to talk about in Lord of the Rings set. It's going to be exciting. Uh I'm saving up my coins on Arena so that I can uh, Same. So, so I can quick draft some of this stuff. Oh yeah. Uh, sadly, quick draft starts like yeah, two weeks after a set comes out on Arenas, which is a bit of a travesty. But you know, gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, yeah. This is gonna be a fun set. By the time we discuss, uh, we're on the podcast next. We will have the a lot of these cards in our possession, and we'll have cracked a lot of them live. On TikTok, Friday, the uh, pre-release day, the 16th of June. Mm-hmm. We'll be cracking a lot, and then we'll be probably playing with some of them on Monday Night Magic the following Monday. Indeed. At least that is the hope. Fingers crossed, guys. That would be ideal. That would be ideal. The next news item, as alluded to at the beginning of the podcast, Pathfinder Remastered drops the drow after moving away from the Dungeons & Dragons OGL. Uh, we've known for a while that Paizo is going to be revising the Pathfinder 2e books, creating Pathfinder 2e Remastered. Uh, and the publisher announced it is going to remove the Drow due to its ties to the open gaming license. On a live stream on May 28th, uh, Paizo confirmed that they will be retconning the Drow out of all Pathfinder 2e books. Uh, the move appears to be directly tied to the D&D OGL controversy from earlier this year. Uh, the narrative creative director, James Jacobs, says the removal comes from the Drow being, quote, really identified with Dungeons and Dragons and quote, it's easier to move in a different direction rather than figure out how to recast or recontextualize them. Hard disagree on that. The idea of dark elves have always been around Mm -hmm. for about as long as elves have existed in the Tolkien universe. Orcs are basically just dark elves. Mm -hmm. And then they got corrupted over a very long period of time. Uh, so I don't necessarily agree with that reasoning. Um, the Drow are one of the classic D&D races. Came in, yeah, it's, while Pathfinder was originally built on the foundations of D&D, Paizo has sought to cut ties since the pro- proposed changes to the OGL. They announced their own license, the Orc license. Uh, the FAQ page makes it clear Pathfinder Remastered is not a new addition, and the older 2E books will remain compatible. That means Drow can still be used in Pathfinder games, they're just no longer part of Galarian's canon. Quote, this is also from Jacobs, the Darklands are really deeply entrenched in the traditions of the OGL, and a lot of creatures are from that resource. And going forward, those are not going to be things. 
So ultimately, they're just removing a large chunk of their own world because of the D and D ness mm-hmm. of the Drow. What do you think, Sam? We've seen other um, create you know creators of the new of these new and up and coming RPGs, TTRPGs that were announced after this past January's uh, you know controversy of the OGL. Um, and for the most part, and a lot of them started in the idea of where we want to be, you know, as far away from D&D, but still be fantasy as possible. So it's interesting that Paizo, which is probably, you know, kind of considered to be the, uh, uh, one of the, one of the leaders, one of the generals in this movement, uh, mm-hmm. to actually be doing this themselves. Honestly, I think it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's a choice that they, that they've made. I don't know if it will detract from their creation as much as they've been trying to make it so that people in the community can more easily create things for it Mm -hmm. um so i can almost imagine that you know maybe we'll see because the the drow in uh, many cases i think i've had a drow in almost every game i've played that's like very a very um desired yeah very popular uh character choice um might see a might see a lot of uh, people creating Pathfinder 2E orc orc license approved uh, Dark Elves Dark Elves <laughs> probably uh, one and then thing- they can fight Thor yeah oh yeah of course of course oh, such a bad movie uh, one of course I think we need to address the elephant in the room that I completely glossed over earlier when reading through this article uh Drow are typically found in the Underdark, worshipping the evil goddess Lulth. And like orcs, the drow have been critiqued in the past for racial stereotyping as they are inherently link as they inherently link dark skin with evil D D alignments. So I feel like that is kind of the core of the reason why they're getting rid of the drow. Mm-hmm. Is to distance themselves from that. Uh Obviously, orcs are a bit more entrenched in fantasy, and it's a lot harder to get rid of the orc than it is the drow, in my mind. Um, Ultimately, you can just change the... Most people want to play drow. There's plenty of examples of drow not being evil, even in official published works of Drids de Erden. Like, the most famous drow ever Mm -hmm. is a good guy. All intents and purposes. So, I don't necessarily... If that's their reason, like their actual reasoning, and they don't want to talk about it, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, ultimately, it's Paizo's game. They can do whatever they want with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, people are absolutely going to create their own version of Dark Elves mm-hmm. to include in Pathfinder properties. Um, do you have anything else you want to say nope. on this matter? All right. The last thing we're going to talk about, Critical Role, they announced two... RPG systems, the Illuminated Worlds system and the Daggerheart system. Uh, Daggerheart is going to be their system that is more closely aligned with Dungeons and Dragons. In it is a D twenty system. It is meant for long form campaigns and storytelling and combat, and it's going to be more your traditional uh, tabletop RPG fantasy Pathfinder D and D style thing and we don't know a lot about it uh they are going to be demoing dagger dagger heart at gen con this year uh those events sold out immediately oh, and yeah. we were not able to get into them uh which is a shame uh they're also going to be dem- demoing uh the illuminated world system which is the system that the new show candela obscura that is on critical role they're doing that monthly is based on uh candela obscura was designed specifically by spencer stark he is the guy he, one of the main designers for kids on brooms uh, another one, one of the kids on type uh, RPG systems. You play kids on bikes. Kids on bikes, yes. Yes. So that's like your Stranger Things. Stranger. It's the base of the of those syst- of those games, and yeah, it's the straight. It's a it's a late nineteen hundreds pre cell phone era Midwest town with spooky things happening in mm-hmm. it. System. Whereas uh, Kids on Brooms is more your Hogwarts and yes. Wizarding School vibe. Uh, it's a D6 pool-based system. I don't know a ton about it. I've never played with a D6 system. I mean, you have. So what? What's what is like so Kids no, uh, on Bikes like? Kids on Bikes is a D20 system. It is a D20 system. It is a D20 system. Um, I've seen other uh, MCDM created a like sub uh, subset of rules for 
party initiatives uh, or party interactions um, for 5e for Dungeons Dragons 5th edition and that was kind of a uh, d6 pool Mm -hmm. basically as you do things you get more d6s and when you go to do a task you can choose to spend Mm -hmm. d6s that's what I'm assuming this is going to be like is you have so many d6s you can spend at any given time Um, the most is oh gosh is Call of Cthulhu a d6 pool system I don't know Look that up. Uh, one that is a D6 pool system, they played the the Western, that Western short run series. On oh, uh, Undeadwood. Undeadwood. That was DM'd by uh, Brian W. Must Not Be Named Foster. Um, if you want to know why he must not be named, check out the last episode of the podcast. We talked about it at the beginning. Um, that was a D6 pool based system, as well as uh, they did a one shot using uh, the Cinder Hearts game system. That's kind of like your CW yeah. show style. I was actually really into that. That was shot. super cool. It was really cool. It was like pull, like you could mechanically pull on emotional threads and stuff. It was f- really fucking cool. Uh, Ali Beardsley from uh, Dimension Twenty was on that, I believe. Uh, and uh, Talison Jaffe it was just a joy. If you were into like the CW, like Vampire Diaries vibe uh, stuff, absolutely check out Cinder Hearts. That one shot from Critical Role is great. But D6 pool based systems are you're using D6s uh, instead of D20s for most of your rolls. Uh, and largely they have mechanics similar to one another. Like if you roll a six on your D6, it explodes and you get to roll it again and add them together. And then you like super succeed on stuff basically. Mm-hmm. Um, the Candela Obscura is a specific game that is built on the Illuminated World system. Uh, I have, I can't remember the specifics because I wasn't able to find it, but people seem to think that Candela Obscura is based very heavily on another D6 pool, uh, based game. Uh, and they basically just kind of reskinned it hmm. for Candela Obscura, which is, I mean, it's totally fine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but Illuminated Worlds is going to be more one-shot, quick, story-based, driven gaming, whereas Daggerheart is the one that I think most people are interested in as, like, the potential D&D killer. I don't think that'll happen. A dagger to the heart of Wizards of the Coast. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that will be happening at all. Uh, I think it'll become one of... I think it'll become one of the pillar... I think... I, we'll, we're going to see a future where tabletop RPGs are going to be the three pillars of... D&D, Pathfinder, and Daggerheart. Hmm. That is what I predict. Um, and there are also people like, oh, are they going to transition Campaign 3 over to Daggerheart when it comes out? And it's like, no. Uh, Campaign 3 is entirely sponsored by D&D Beyond, and it has been since the first episode, and they sponsored the entire campaign. Mm-hmm. So Campaign 3 is going to end as a D&D campaign. Um, some people are theorizing that Campaign 3 is going to end with like a resetting of the world of Exandria and the Pantheon with all the stuff that's going on. Which could be their way of in-world logicking uh, the change from D and D to Daggerheart for a potential campaign for, but that's all just massive speculation at this point. Uh, but ultimately, if you are interested in Candela Obscura, the first episode is out. I believe they're doing one every month, and they have four planned, and I think they're all one shots too. Mm. So you don't have to like keep track of all of them. You can watch one and be done. One um, done. They also have a quick start, a quick start, a quick chart, if you will. Gross. A quick chart guide. <laughs> Never trust a fart. Yes, uh, which you can download for free on shop.critroll.com. Um, seems pretty neat. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm in, I'm always into experiencing some new RPGs. We talked about what we want to do at Gen Con, as yes. well, previously, and I would love to try out things like Vampire the Masquerade and all that. Those are the core. Uh, those are those are the news items for the week. A fairly light week. A light in news, week. which you know, kind of refreshing for once. Very refreshing. Very, very refreshing. Uh, but as always, we like to end each episode of the podcast by taking questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from the people that watch us, uh, specifically in the TikTok Live, as we record this podcast every other week live on TikTok, and. Um, yeah, while Sam looks at the comments and gets a couple juicy ones lined up, I'll vamp for a little bit as uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Have the Critical Role book review coming up in the uh, coming up on <laughs> one of those days, and uh, I would love to do have a have a discussion about the monetization of D anD D in a YouTube video. That's that's one of the that's one of the ideas that I have as well. Talking about monetization, 
and why seventy dollars may not be bad, but it's definitely not good. Mm-hmm. You know. Um. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram. Sam Sam's been doing the learn to play shorts as he has been for quite a while. Instagram steadily growing. I like I like what's going on over on the Instagram. I'm a big fan. Of course, you can join our Discord server. Uh, link in the new beacon beacons.ai link tree. Um, apparently, people struggle to use the TikTok app, so you might want to copy the link and then open it in a browser because it totally worked fine on my PC. But I'll probably change the link anyway just to be safe. Uh, you can also find our Amazon affiliate store there where you can buy things like deck boxes and these cool card frames that we have on set and uh, the play mats that we use for our Monday Night Magic live streams every week, 9 p.m. Eastern time on the TikTok Live. Samuel, what do we got from the TikTok Live audience? Wolf Dez uh, asks... Oh, yes, from, yes. from last night's stream. Yes. Wolf is there. Asks, what do you think on Vampire Deck slash Olivia? No, oh, I have an Olivia and Crimson Bride slash Edgar Charmed Groom Rule Zero Partner Commander deck. Mm-hmm. Um, I think of, with the exception of the single Edgar Markov card that is worth like $80, uh, pretty much all of the printings of Olivia are more powerful than the other printings of Edgar. <laughs> um, it depends on what version of Olivia. Olivia Voldaren is popular. Olivia Crimson Bride I'm a big fan of. A little, little bit of cheating things out of the graveyard cheating big things out of the graveyard always love that right. vampires are great great tribe uh mia asks how do you justify playing D while watsi is an impressive detractor of the rpg space i don't feel the need to justify anything um play what you like to play and if you don't want to support wizards of the coast it is very easy to go to goodwill go to ebay to buy D&D, like the player's handbook and the DMG, which when resold, none of that money goes to Wizards of the Coast because the money already did at one point. Mm-hmm. And if you want to play D&D, you don't have to buy anything. Let me, let me repeat this. If you want to play Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, you do not have to buy anything. Player, the player's handbook is Creative Commons now. Mm-hmm. And after the OGL fiasco, all of 5e is Creative Commons. The entire player's handbook you can find online. As we have talked before, uh, you should not check out the website 5e.tools. That's 5e.tools. Do not look at that website. They do not have all of the books easily browsable with all of the contents in them. That doesn't exist. Don't look at that. Also, just like the amount of third-party content, you can support a lot of great creators that have created a lot of amazing third-party work. Um, obviously, we have we have some a lot from MCDM, mm-hmm. um, Matt Koval. Uh, we have Scribbles Co- Stibbles Codex of Companions. Uh, we have made our own, the Blood Magic and Hemocraft supplement that is 5e compatible. You can check out on our drive through RPG, mm-hmm. which is also linked in the bio. Um, yeah, uh, I don't feel the need to justify it at all because I'm... I don't, you don't, you can, you can partake in art and you can partake in products without supporting the producer of the art and the products. And you can still also play other TTRPGs. Absolutely. Um, the, the space itself, I think that's, I don't want to say misconception among people, but commonly I feel like everybody has to choose brand loyalty and by any mean, by no means are we brand loyal to Wizards of the Coast. Um, I mean, to be fair... Are we big fans of Magic the Gathering? Yes. Yeah. Are we big fans of D&D? Yeah. But, you know, if Lorcana is really cool and Magic the Gathering starts to really suck, we might move. Yeah. We might try out Flesh and Blood. Fuck, we might try out Yu-Gi-Oh. Yu-Gi-Oh. We I might, don't know if I'm we, might, that. we might stop showering and, and destroy all of our deodorant and never buy it again and start playing Yu-Gi-Oh. I don't know. That might be a thing that happens. Or could go play Digimon and not be degenerates. Yeah. We could do that, or we could just uh, pick one of pick an anime and then do the trading card game for that anime. That every anime seems to have the trading card game of, where they release like a base set and one other set, and oh, then yeah. that's all that ever gets released. <laughs> that's a big thing in Japan. Luke eight four two four says uh, uh, it hates the fact that the Balrog is legendary. It's just a random Balrog. Yeah, it's not even well. It's Balrog, Flame of Udun. So it is the Balrog that is that comes up in Moria, 
when they travel through Moria. Um, oh, that was my own laptop. I thought I had it muted. <laughs> I did have it muted. How did you? You know, we're just gonna we're just gonna double mute you. How? How? I have everything muted. All right, whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm fine with it being legendary. Um, I don't know why you would use it as a commander. Also, I don't know why you would want to like copy it or anything. So, um, Max says, hello, I'm new to D&D and all the info is overwhelming. Any tips for newbies? Uh, yes, find a wise bearded man to teach you the ways. Yeah. Or, uh, honestly, the best, I, best thing is to... Just go on YouTube, and uh, there are so many great creators out there mm. with with in uh, very detailed videos, step by step of how to you know get started, um, in 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 D and D specifically, but in in any TTRPG really. There's so much. Uh, there's so many good creators in the space nowadays. Yeah, um, I learned the rules and mechanics of D and D from an animated creator uh, on YouTube. Don't stop thinking. Uh, they have a playlist of how to play Dungeons and Dragons, and it is an amazing playlist of uh, that goes through all of the individual classes. It goes over character creation, everything you need to know as a player on how to play D and D and how your class would work. Um, also, watching live play shows and seeing people actually play D and D is a great way to learn. And more, most importantly, finding out who amongst any friends that you have already play D&D because &D. Mm -hmm. if you express interest in playing D&D &D to friends that already play D&D &D, you'll very quickly be learning and playing D&D &D. <laughs> um I identify as anime titties <laughs> asks what do you do if you accidentally shit yourself at the session asking for a friend <laughs> you better hope somebody has uh has prestidigitation um oh. Oh my god. Has prestidigitation uh that that was a roller coaster of a comment. Um asking for a friend, obviously. obviously. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um make sure that there's a bathroom. Um hopefully you've worn enough layers that it didn't seep through anything anything in the time it took to get from the game table to the bathroom. I, I'm done talking about this. All right. <laughs> Please feel free to write in with your favorite um, poop stories. Uh, let's see. A little bit of conversation about the drow. A little bit of conversation about the different, um, the different, the several different, uh, what you call it, the different systems we talked about. Apparently. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, I did look it up. Call of Cthulhu is a percentile die system. Oh, that's right. It is percentile. Uh, I hate the percentile dice. I'm sorry. Hmm? I really. I like it. Just a giant fan. big D100. Giant giant big D100 is cool, but the like the systems built around percentiles they they like they give me agita. You know, they they they, they make me like fucking anxious. Uh, Zach point, uh, Zach says that uh, Star Trek Adventures has a brilliant 2d20 target system interesting there's so many rpgs man there's so many tabletop rpgs you do not have to play dungeons and dragons if you don't want to there's so many different ways to play different dice it's amazing i want i want a d3 based system a d3 based system not a d6 like ooh, d6 minus no but like a d3 like a football shaped yeah interesting yeah. Ooh, i want a d1 system that'd be funny a d1 it just happens <laughs> yeah <laughs> every, it's, not every even, it's not even binary it's just it happens it happens or it yeah. just doesn't happen it's yeah not, it does it's not either it doesn't happen or it doesn't happen it's just one or the other yeah the whole uh, game oh yeah 100 percent, 100 percent, 100 percent. all right um, oh my, there's, there's a string of comments, but uh, just gonna call the last thing. Tyson Svedson says, I think I'm currently at 37 different systems tested. Oh, wow. The leveling uh, and has experienced leveling systems versus XP systems. I have learned to love XP sp spending systems and totally do not look at 5e.wiki. Wiki dot. <laughs> yeah, try a key at four, key forged. Yeah. 5e dot tools, uh, 5e wiki dot. Um, don't look at any of those. Literally just Google D and D five E spells and you'll see every spell that has ever been printed. Like 
that's why that's why part of me is like I don't really care that they're increasing the price of these books to seventy dollars because the moment I'm not buying them within a week of them coming out, you can just find anything you want from those books online for free. Yeah, you don't need the books is the thing. Will we be buying some of these books? Maybe, probably. I would I would venture to say we probably will. I mean, obviously we're going to get the new Player's Handbook, Dungeon Master's Guide, Monster Manual. You got. We you just got to update the core. Sure, gotta yeah. have fill up that shelf we have. Exactly, exactly. That shelf is dangerously close to being at maximum capacity, and I want to fucking max that bitch out. You know what I'm saying? I do. You know what I'm saying? Just max it out. Just jam, just ram it full of books. Anyway, just jam, just jam the entire shelf full of all of the the book sees. I think Precious. I think we're getting to the point where Connor is delusional. Uh, so that's just my default state of being. So let's not, uh, let's not glorify it. Shall we? Shall we? Uh, shall we bring this to a wrap? Yes. Uh, check out the merch store. We have some Dungeon Bros merch. You can get stickers. You can get shirts. You can get all that kind of stuff. Check us out every Monday live on TikTok at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we want to do. Ooh, Sam and I want to do game streaming on our own personal channels, and we'll probably also simul stream a little bit of that to our Dungeon Bros TikTok. Uh, we'll do our best to show that it's not the Dungeon Bros official thing. It's just us individually, and we're mm-hmm. just going to have it live on TikTok because that's just easier. Um, so feel free to l- look out for that. Um, join our Discord server. Link in the link tree in the bio. And uh, thank you again to Daedalic Entertainment for uh, sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Lord of Rain Gollum. Don't buy it. <laughs> Don't buy it. Um, this is we we've clocked in at a cool hour. Love it. So I call that I call that pretty good. So well, in the meantime, guys, thank you so much, and peace. 